morning, everyone. Lee Jondro here with Abundant Grace Fellowship. Uh, I broadcast through Zoom and it should end up on Facebook Live. And I'm sure if it's not, my wife will let me know in a few minutes. Uh, one of the reasons I do this, quite honestly, is being distracted is really hard for me. The first couple of times I, I tried to do Facebook Live, what I found was all the icons coming up on the side and everything. Uh, I'm sure there's a way to fix that, but that's not who I am. Uh, just tried to uh, make it work. So good morning. It's a beautiful day here in Keene. It's a little windy, a little cool, a uh, little change of weather after the last couple of days. Uh, yesterday afternoon, I was able to uh, get an opportunity to go out on a ride on my motorcycle, so that was pretty cool, and it was it was very nice. It was about 79 degrees by the time I got out there. So before I start my message this morning, I want to just take a moment and pray. Father, we lift up. First and foremost, we bless your name. Father, it says that we can enter your gates with thanksgiving and praise, and then in the midst of entering in through thanksgiving and praise, Lord God, that we enter through this gate into another realm, another reality, another dimension, perhaps. So, Father, we're, we're thankful for what you're doing. We're grateful for what you've, you've done in our own lives. We're grateful for the work that you're doing in our families and our friends and our community and our nation. And all those things, Lord God, we just give you all the glory and we bless your name. So, this morning, um, we're going to do things the way we, we do on some levels. Uh, I'm going to share a message. Some people have asked. We've, we've had visitors from uh, who don't necessarily attend uh, Abundant Grace Fellowship. And so if you're interested in giving during the service or anything, you can give electronically. Uh, there's some uh, notes at the top of this page. Uh, I know some of you are doing watch parties. For those of you who don't understand what a watch party is, uh, when you're watching this video, it gives you the opportunity, you can share it on your wall, you can share it on your own page, you can share it to a, uh, a group. I wouldn't ask that you would do that without permission. Uh, but you're welcome to share it publicly or on your own wall, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. And we appreciate that. Um, so that's called a watch party. If you haven't done one, basically all it does is just open it up and you just share the video and it's there. So the other thing is at the end of my message, we'll take communion together. So if you're one of the folks who enjoys taking communion with us, and obviously we're doing it virtually, um, but we take communion together because we believe in who we are in him. We believe that we're one body and we believe that we, we can still gather in him and we believe in the healing power of, of communion. We believe in the gathering power of communion. We believe in the loving power of communion. And, and I would say that all those things fall under the heading of miraculous powers. So I wanna talk about love today. I've been thinking about this. There's been a lot of things going on in the world. There's been a lot of things going on. You know, we just came through a long drawn out period with COVID-19, a lot of isolation, a lot of staying at home, a lot of rules, a lot of rules we didn't understand, a lot of things that um, have challenged us. They've challenged us physically, they've challenged us emotionally, they've ch challenged us financially, they've challenged us spiritually, and they've, they've changed the way we do business on so many levels. Um, we, we would do uh, videos like this from time to time, but we would never do our whole service. I, I know that going forward, you know, our, we're going to be looking at the financial to see if we can make purchase of a, a camera and a little in, interface to make these things easier, to make them better, to do all those things and to help others who some of them may not be able to get out because of COVID-19, because of home sicknesses and things like that. I joke with my grandchildren and my children, you know, school has changed. I mean, you know, we, everybody began virtually schooling. Do we ever really think there's going to be a snow day again? <laughs> you know? And, and so the same, same follows through for church gatherings and, and things. But earlier this week, a lot was going on. There was protests that began. Uh, and there was just a lot of things that individually, 
and corporately, not just as a church fellowship, but businesses, how do we handle these things? And what do we do with these things? Uh, I wanna say right up front, those of you who don't know me, uh, I have a black son-in-law, I have a brown grandson, I have biracial nieces and nephews, and I say that not to say, hey, I know what I'm doing, but to simply say that I speak from this having watched some of the challenges that they've gone through. And, and so that's not what my message is about, other than to say that that was probably where some of my thinking began to internalize and began to crystallize. And so again, I say that we have a lot of things to sort out. And, and the only way I know how to sort things out is I write them down on paper, and then I go to the Word of God, and then I reach out to God and say, okay, where am I at with this? I read uh, a friend's post from a man that I, I really like, his name is Brian Zahn, and he said, um, we should never strive to make our world a battlefield, but we should work hard to make it a garden. And I'm reminded of the fact that, you know, some people might already go, yeah, but some of those gardens have weeds. But if we read the story of the tares <clears throat> in the wheat, we find that Jesus said, hey, don't worry about that stuff. I'll take care of that. There will be weeds that will grow up in your garden. Some prefer to prefer see those as people. I just think that there are challenges and things like that to come along, not that they can't happen through people. And so let's work really hard at not making our lives a battlefield. It says we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the air. And that's, uh, that's Ephesians 6, and that's Paul talking. But even in, even in the battle that we have, you know, the battle against principalities and powers and rulers of the air, you know, we're already seated in high, high places or heavenly places, far above principality, far above the authority of the devil, of the, uh, of the enemy of our souls. Whatever term you, you, you choose to use, we're already in a seatedness place. You know, we've already come through the crucifixion and the death and, and the resurrection and the, the, the uh, um, ascension. And now we're seated above those things. So we battle not against flesh and blood, but against things that aren't of this world and things that are perhaps evil and demonic and all those things. And so I began to think about these things and because, you know, you can't avoid it. Um, well, you can't. And you can be an ostrich and you can put your head in the sand and you can think nothing's ever going to happen. But I think we all have come to figure out that's not true. <clears throat> so yesterday uh, I had a surprise. Uh, there was a knock at my door to, earlier in the morning. I, I was thinking about what I was going to speak on today. I was thinking about where I was going to ride my motorcycle. I was thinking about going away next weekend for a day and just going out on a lake that I love in upper state New York. And, you know, where was I going to find food and who was I going to take with me? And all, all, all those things, there was a knock on the door. Little knock. And because it was a little knock, I knew it wasn't a, an adult because adults... <laughs> But this was a little knock, and I went, hmm. I know that some of the neighborhood kids will often come over to my house and visit with me or to pick things up or just to stop by. Can I borrow your basketball? You know, is your grandson here? All those things. So I thought maybe it was them, and I opened the door, and it took me a second to grab onto it, but here's this short little kid, and, well, it was my grandson. It was my grandson, Marcel, and my daughter was filming this, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy because we hadn't seen each other for seven months. It was Thanksgiving and then things were going on. And, you know, out of the clear blue sky, here's my daughter and, and, and my, my grandson. And they came in and they spent the whole day. And in the midst of all this, I was thinking about what is love and how does that translate? And I thought I had this whole message together, and then the Lord just spun it off in the midst of yesterday. You know, earlier this week, I was thinking that, you know, people often say, love should never hurt. And I and, and started to think about that earlier this week, and I, and, and I absolutely agree, love should never hurt for the recipient. If someone tells you they love you and they're hurting you, that's wrong. I mean, all the way to the far ends of abuse and all that. But even in the midst of that, I love you, but you're a jerk. It doesn't wash from me. Um, and so I began to think about that. 
And, and what I realized was just like the father of, the, of the, the prodigal son, we call him the prodigal son, you know, just like that father, uh, I think we need to step back and realize that there's a sacrificial love that we have or we need to have or we need to grow into because it's actually part of our DNA because we are the DNA. We are, we are the offspring. We know all these things of God. And in the book of Micah, it says God is love. And so he can't change who he is. And because that's part and parcel of who we are. And, and so through the incarnation or the, the, the webbing together or the, uh, the knitting together of God and man, you know, he took on frail humanity. And, and he brought that into a place that, you know, we don't know where the beginning is and where the end is when it comes to God and man. We know that we're human and we know that we're godly and, and we're this supernatural being. Um, so we can always say, well, we're only just human, but that really doesn't wash because we have the mind of Christ and we have the DNA of the Father. And we have his characteristics. We may not recognize those things. We may deny those things. And, and yet we, uh, we need to recognize it. And so our love needs to be sacrificial. And, and I know that a lot of people don't agree with that. You know, well, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. But I'm not going to debate you. And I'm not going to tell you my opinion so much. Or I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to be like Paul in 2 Corinthians 9. I give up my rights. I give up my rights. Well, Lee, I, I, I have rights. Okay. But maybe sacrificially, we give up our rights. Maybe sacrificially, we give up our opinions. And maybe when we do that, we begin to see what the Father is actually doing in the big picture. So today I'm going to walk you through 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm going to share some things, and some of it's going to be teaching, and some of it's going to be exhortation, some of it's going to be prophetic, um, and, and things like that. But let's just start with the word agape. We all know, we've all heard it, we, we ministries use it in their name, we, we talk about the multiple kinds of love that are found in the Bible, phileo, and eros and, and agape and phileo is the brother to brother thing and eros is the intimacy between a husband and wife and and agape is that big one the one that everybody talks about but they don't like to dialogue about it because right from the get-go you have to deal with things so let me just share some of the some of the greek wording behind it because in the bible we read the word love multiple times and yet it has three different three distinctive words as i said the phileo the brotherly love the eros the intimacy of husband and wife and and the agape the unconditional sacrificial oh there's that word sacrificial that sacrificial love and so the word was borrowed from the word for charity or the love of a parent and in biblical texts, it, it, it connotes a selfless love. Well, Lee, what about me? See, see, this is where opinions and rights begin to move to the side. Because yes, we need to love God. And yes, we need to love ourselves. But in part, the purpose behind that is so that we can love others. The expansion of the kingdom of God isn't a fight. As Brian Zahn said, let's not make it a battlefield. But let's begin to view it as a garden. And, and, and so it's a divine love that gives and gives and gives again. Even when it's not responded to. Even when there's no thankfulness for it. There's no gratitude for it. Hey, there's no acknowledgement of it. Even when those circumstances occur, we still love. And so it's not based on a response. 
It's based on a decision by you and I to love regardless. Regardless of the recipient's response or the lack of response. So agape said this for many, many years. You know, there's this two word phrase that many people use. It's called tough love. And many people have used tough love. It, I think it probably began in psychological worlds, 12 step programs. And I think there's a validity to how it began, but not everybody understands the word tough the way it may have originally been intended or the way it was originally used. Um, so I just read yesterday, what happens to words? I just read yesterday that if you type in the word Zoom, now six months ago, if you typed in the word Zoom, Z-O-O-M, it would talk about the noise, getting to some place, all those things. Now, it auto-corrects it and it capitalizes it because as you can see at the lower uh, right hand of your screen, it says Zoom because I use a product, a software program called Zoom. And it's a method and a manner to do conferences, things like this. So we don't always understand words. And so it's kind of important that we go back to what words actually mean. And, and so that's why I started with agape. You may not read Greek and I may not understand all Greek, but I do understand what Greek is and I understand where the beginning of a word comes from. And, you know, we live in America and we have tens of thousands of words, but all of our words don't come from the same place. Sometimes we have a word that's used in, you know, a Spanish or a Latin culture or a Mexican culture like taco and it translates to taco in English, but we may have another word that has a root to it, you know, a root word, a beginning, it began in Latin or it began in Arabic or it began, you know, all these things. And it doesn't just go agape, agape. No, because what happened was agape got translated to love and it's applicable, but it doesn't give us the fullness of the word. So when we talk about tough love, I'm just going to tell you that I firmly believe that tough love is agape love because to not get a response or an acknowledgement of your love towards somebody, that's tougher than going, you know what, when you get your life together, I'll be in it. But that's not what agape does. That's what tough love, the way many people understand it. But the tough love of agape, and we're going to get to this, doesn't bail out. So let me begin 1 Corinthians 13. I've given you the background of the word. Verse 1 says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, and, sometimes, and that word actually has the ability to translate in Greek, to the, the word pastor. So if I speak in the words of tongue, in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, and in and, and the, uh, the word, you know, when they define that word in context, uh, it, it, when it says have not love, it's talking about, I don't have that reasoning or that intentional in it. It's, it's talking about a spiritual devotion inspired by God's love in us and for us. And so, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a ringing gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm just making noise. I'm not changing anything, but I'm just making noise. And so, verse 2 goes on to say, if I have the gift of prophecy or the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have absolute faith so as to move mountains, we know that scripture uh, that occurs where it says, speak to the mountain. Be thou, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. It's talking about a prayer life. You can speak to something and move it out of the way. Have absolute faith so as to move mountains, but I don't have love or I don't have agape or I don't have that unconditional love. I am nothing. Now, it's not saying because you don't have love, you're nothing, nothing. But what it's saying is there's no, there's no value coming out right now. There's no transformational value being brought. You're, you're, you know, just all the way back to enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise. We want to change to a realm that's transformational. Same thing. If we don't have this, then our transformation process is hindered. 
Our garden doesn't grow. Uh, the uh, Amplified Bible says, if I have prophetic powers, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose and understand all the truths and mysteries and possess all the knowledge, and if I have sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not God's love in me, I am a useless nobody. Now, again, it's not saying you're nothing, nobody. It's saying you're useless. There is not, you are without use in this particular aspect. So love is the transformation that we need to embrace. Now, because we're the DNA of the Father, it's, it's, it's in there. It's like the old commercial for spaghetti sauce. It's in there. We just need to open the top, pour it on our pasta. Same thing. You know, love abides. We need to abide in love. Verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor and I exalt in the surrender of my body, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Revelations 12, 11 says that um, they have conquered him, meaning the work of the enemy or the, the, the enemy of their soul. They have conquered him by the, the blood of, their, of the lamb, by the word of the testimony, and they live their lives even unto death. You know, I was asked earlier this week about the protest. Should I go? What happens if something bad happens? This is my core scripture for that. Something bad could happen. And don't get me wrong. I'm, I don't minimize it. And I don't, I'm not saying don't think about this. This would probably be one of those ones that would be a good time to count the cost. But if you're going to go to a protest or you're going to put yourself in a situation that might put you in harm's way, this is probably one of my go-to scriptures. They, you know, they, they defeated him by the blood of the lamb, the word of the testimony, and they live their lives even unto death. And everybody said, yay. No, probably not. So, so um, I think it's important that we begin to recognize as we talk about agape. You know, the Bible says, uh, Galatians 2.20, that we were crucified with him. That means we were dead. There's only, there's a time man was appointed to die. There's another scripture that says that. And we live, we live our lives as we're already dead because it's not the life that we have, but it's the life of him living through us. We open the, the top of the pot, uh, spaghetti sauce, so to speak. We open love. And even from our deadness, life comes because it's him who dwells within us. Verse 4, uh, by the way, there's 2 Peter 3.18 says that we, we can, you know, grow in grace and grow in understanding. A friend of mine made a post yesterday about that very scripture. And he said, if we all would just do that, all these situations we see would be gone. Basically, what he was saying was, let's mature into growing in grace. Let's mature into understanding. Let's just not read a scripture and call it close enough, but let's embrace it. So verse four says, love is patient, and it means to be long, uh, long spirited, forbearing or patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. The uh, Amplified says, love endures long and is patient and kind, and love is never envious, nor does it boil over with jealousy. It's not boastful or vainglorious, and it does not display itself haughtily. I don't know about you, but I read the news and I see a lot of haughtiness. I see a lot of people who think it's their way or the highway. So I'm not going to dwell on that, I'm not trying to make it political or news or anything other than to say, if people actually walked in love, a lot of those displays would go away. So let's talk about verse four. Paul begins his description, and he says, charity, or agape, suffers long. And it, that word comes from two Greek words. It actually, the, the word itself is, is macrothumia, and it's a compound of two words, macros and thumia. Lee, you're speaking Greek. Yes, just for a moment. As noted earlier, the word macros means long. So when you have a macro view or something, you have a long view versus a micro view, which is close up. And, and so that's where the word comes from. And the entomology, if you will, big word, simply means there's a basis of where words come from. And so it may mean that 
you know, it, it, the word macros indicates something long or distant, far away or remote or long duration. And ironically, I think it's ironic, thumos means anger, but it also embodies the swelling up of impassion for something. And, and what it's saying is the same thing that might drive anger, if you will, is, is this piece. So when these two words are put into one, becoming macrothumia, it talks about patience as the restraint of anger and therefore long suffering. It gets translated in, in English into forbearance and into the word patience. And, and so I heard this definition many years ago. It's like a candle that has a very, very long wick. And because the wick is very long, it's prepared to burn a long time. It's ready to forbear and patiently allow things to happen to allow a person to come around, if you will, to s wait for the change, the progress, um, till they begin to understand what you're trying to communicate to them. You know, my children would say to me, and I, I, I realize the uh, analogy is outdated, but they would say, dad's a broken record, because if there was something I wanted to get across, I oftentimes would say it until I saw it come to pass. I wasn't trying to be a broken record, but I was trying to get a point across and I knew that I might tell them don't run in the road today and they'd still run in the road. And I knew I might tell them don't run in the road tomorrow and they still might run in the road. But at some point I would see them begin to hesitate and look around to see if I was watching. And, it, and then at some point, all of a sudden they don't run in the road. And so what this is saying is when my feelings, when I have agape feelings for someone, I'm so passionate, I don't easily give up or get out of it. Uh, I keep on going and going and going with someone, even though they don't respond, even though I don't get the acknowledgement or the response that I'm looking for. It doesn't mean I pull the plug, it just means I'm going to suffer long. And so when Paul says, charity suffers long, King James, but love suffers longer. Love is, you know, what he's saying is love, he's saying love, action word, love patiently and passionately bears with others for as long as patience is needed. Lee, I don't think I'm into that. <laughs> okay, that's your choice. But when you make the decision that you want to be more like Jesus, you know, Jesus even said, how long will I suffer these people to be with them? I don't think he was looking for an out. I think he was looking for a light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm not saying he didn't know. What I'm saying is that we just need to understand that not everybody gets it. Back to my age old talk about, you know, Moses leading the people across um, the Red Sea as the waters parted, not everybody's perspective was the same as Moses. Moses' perspective was, wow, water opened up, we're going. People in the back hear the, hear the horses and the, and the sounds of uh, horns and the call to battle as Pharaoh's chasing them. Perspective. So he's saying it's gonna take a time. And you know, our human side, has the ability to be short-tempered, has the ability to be intolerant. But our DNA, the spiritual piece, the incarnate one with us is the agape. So the Bible tells us in Proverbs that we're to be slow to anger and slow to wrath, and it doesn't know how to quit. And it supernaturally, because agape is a faith piece, not your faith, his faith through you. It's, it's, uh, it becomes stronger and more committed the longer it takes to get through to the heart of the one who is loved. This is a miraculous love. It took 36 years for me to hear the words of the Lord. Lee, I don't have that long. Yeah, okay. Um, agape transforms people's transforms people and it changes their life. And my prayer for you is Jesus, 
cause them to embrace agape love, that they might become long suffering, that they might understand patience, because patience is more than a virtue. It is, it is, it is a place that you sit in peace, even when everything doesn't look peaceful. And so after that, Paul tells us, still in chapter four, or verse four, that uh, love is kind. And that word is a very long word, uh, which basically is presto mai, and it means to be adaptable or compliant to the needs of others. Okay, Lee, I wasn't doing well with patience, and now you're telling me I need to adapt my life to the needs of others. Oh, that was a question? Yes. <laughs> um, because when agape is working in your life, you don't demand that others look like you. Uh, instead, it makes you want to bend over backwards to become what others need you to be. Paul said, I am all things to all men. He also said, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, people followed him because he was following Christ, even though uh, I don't want to be all things to all people. Not a chance. And yet, you know, this is where we run up against that thing about tribes. Oh, I found my tribe. When, what, what people often mean by that, I found people I'm comfortable with. I found people I agree with. I found people who agree with me. I don't want to change my style. There are people that I am absolutely more comfortable with than others. But if I'm going to see myself as a supernatural being, if I'm going to see myself as walking in the love of the Father, or if I'm going to allow myself to be led by the Holy One, then I'm going to find myself going outside my comfort zone or my tribe or my sphere of inclusivity because when I've made it inclusive and these are my people, what I often find is that circle, Jesus is on the other side and saying, come on over. I have some people I want you to meet. And so the word kind, it, it changes because it, it, it means that we're going to have to develop this willingness to serve, and we're going to have to embrace a change in order to serve others. And that's the opposite of selfishness and self-centeredness, because it's either one or the other. There's really not a lot of gray area. There used to be a guy, and his name was Marilyn Manson, and some of you may know the story, you may know who he is. Effectively, he was, he was a cast off in a youth group. And he got cast off so much that he basically started his own cult through music. Well, a lot of people were adamant that he's not coming to our city, he's not coming to our city, he's definitely not coming to our city. But what they didn't plan on was there was a couple of churches and what they did was they baked lots of cookies and they bought lots of tickets and they went in and they sat down with all these followers of Marilyn Manson and they gave these young people, because they were predominantly young, they gave them cookies. They, they said, we could stay with our tribe and we could bash, but let's go in and be loving. And there's some other supernatural things that happen in a couple of those meetings, and I'm just not going to share them with you. You're welcome to go up and research them. You can call me, whatever. I'm not looking for a conversation. There were some crazy cool things that happened. And they brought cookies, and they brought love. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs that a gift given to someone who's your enemy is a bribe to change their heart. You can go look that up. So what, what comes out of this is when it's talking about kindness is love doesn't demand others look like itself. It is so focused on the needs of others that it bends over backwards to become what others need. What does your enemy need from you? What does your worst nightmare of a person in your life need from you? Back to are we long-suffering? Are we kind? 
or do we just snuff it off? Do we just cut the wick off on that candle and say, enough's enough? Continuing on in verse four, Paul tells us that agape love does not envy. And that word is zelo, C-E-L-O-S. And it means that a person is radically consumed with their own ideas and their own desires and their own plans. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about where I'm going. And it's all about how I'm going to get there. And so this person is so bent on where they're going that they're willing to sacrifice anyone or anywhere or anything to get where they're going. Many, many years ago, I've shared this story. I did something really, really dumb. Um, it was probably 35 years ago. I had this friend. He was living in a place. He wanted to move, but he hadn't told the landlord. I had an opportunity to make money on the sale of the house, so I called the landlord. I lost my friendship with my friend. I gained the listing, but I lost everything. Now, this was pre-Christ, but I stand behind what I say, that it wasn't one of my better moments. And, and so envy will drive us to do things at any cost, any person, anything. And so Paul says, don't be, don't be envious. What he's saying is, don't be ambitious. Don't be self-centered and don't be consumed with, so that you never think about others. You know, sometimes they use this word narcissism. Basically, it's a person, I'm not going to do the psychological piece. It's a person who can only think of themselves. And, and I look at that person and say, because they don't understand who they are in Christ. Um, it's their way or their highway. And so when all these things get put together... Verse 4 translates to love passionately bears with others for as long as patience is needed and love doesn't demand others to be like itself, but is so focused on the needs of others that it bends over backwards to become what others need it to be. This, this love is not ambitious, it's not self-centered, and it's not consumed with itself so that it doesn't think of others' needs or the desires that others possess. That's a lot right there. When most of us struggle with love, I would submit to you, verse four is probably one of our greatest challenges out of all the passages in verse 13, or chapter 13. So verse five says, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no account of wrongs. So what the uh, Amplified says, it's not conceited, it's not arrogant, it's not inflated with pride, it's not rude, unmannerly, it does not act unbecomingly, because God's love in us does not demand on its own rights or its own ways. For it is not self-seeking, it is not touchy, it's not fretful, it's not revent resentful, and it takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Youch. I'm not going to devote as much time to this verse as I did to chapter uh, to verse four, but I think that each one of us could read verse five and and recognize that we love doesn't act improperly. It's not selfish. It's not easily provoked. It doesn't go zero to sixty. It doesn't account. Hey, you did this to me a year ago, a month ago, a million years ago, and this is why I'm like this in your life. No accounting. Legalism accounts. Grace doesn't do math. Grace doesn't do math. You and I received a gift of far more than we could ever deserve. And I'm not the guy who thinks that grace is undeserved, unmerited favor, because that still sounds like I owe something. But I do believe you and I couldn't have accomplished that on our own. I, I made a post in the last couple of days. Grace was the answer to things that were never asked. Accounting is a legalistic process, if you will. Keeping accounts, you know, short accounts is the best way. I don't remember, or even if I do remember the hurt you did to me yesterday, today's today. And God gives me blessings and mercies that are new every morning, Lamentations 2 2. 
if my blessings and mercies are new every morning, then I guess I ought to live that out with you too. And then we get to verse six. Love takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Love does not get even. Again, back to the accounting piece. It's not striving to get even. And, and so we don't rejoice in the evil when, you know, we don't, we just don't get caught up in what somebody deserved. I guess let's put it there. You know, everybody, fe not everybody, let me clarify. No, let me no, not even clarify. Let me revise that. Many people believe in the punitive structure of legalism. And the problem with legalism is even if you dabble in it a little, you've dabbled in it a lot. The law is the stumbling block. But if you just drink grace, pure, unadulterated, and don't allow legalism to creep into it, you find that you don't think people deserve what they get. You find that it's a tragedy or a travesty when bad things happen to people. You don't find yourself going, well, what did they expect? If they hadn't done that, that wouldn't have happened. Let it go. Let it go. No, I don't like the Frozen song. I just know that it's important that we let things go. And then we get to verse 7. Many years ago, my daughter Amy was probably about four. And she was reading this, and I gave her this little card. and says, love bears and she absolutely had a meltdown in my car i know exactly where i was on the road i was in up in heartland vermont i know exactly when she started crying she goes dad i can't love bears i just can't and that's a funny little story to enter into this because verse 7 says that love bears up under anything and everything that comes and is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. So I'm going to walk you through some of the Greek. The word for, be for bears all things is the Greek word stego, S-T-E-G-O. And it's defined as to cover as a roof covers a house. But within the word, itself is the concept of protection. Just as a roof protects against or shields and guards the inhabitants of a house from the exposure to storms and hurricanes and tornadoes and rain and hail and snow and all those things, even hot suns, that's what it stands for. This protection is vital for survival in most climates. It protects people from freezing. It protects them from burning up or from getting sick from a continual uh, exposure. Paul lets you know in this verse that agape is that protection. Agape is the serving of that protection. And so like the roof of a house, a friend who moves in the agape love of the Lord serves or acts or walks in as a protection to you from the elements of spiritual things. And, and so they hover in your life to protect you. Rather than exposing you, rather than pointing out your flaws and you deserve that and you should have known better and all those things that have to do with the accounting side of legalism, They protect you from those things. And they'll conceal you. It says love covers a multitude of sins. Multiple times in the scriptures, love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of goofiness, of mistakes, and things like that. And so what it's saying is love protects, shields, guards, covers, conceals, and safeguards people from exposure. It bears all things, all things. And if you know me, my walk with the Lord began in 
really crazy circumstances. And yet this was one of my go-to chapters because I thought I knew what love was, but I didn't. And so I had to rely on the father to expose me to his love that I would be able to walk in this with people that did me wrong. Next part of it says that it believes all things. That word is another Greek word, pistio, and it means to put one's faith or trust in someone or something. And the way it's written in the text, it lets us know that it never stops, that it's always believing the best in each and every situation, that when someone does me wrong or someone does you wrong, you and I are to believe the best. Well, Lee, what if it's true? I don't care if it's true. Well, Lee, that's your opinion. No, no, no. That's what this says. Because if we don't have agape love, what it says is we're a clanging cymbal or a very loud bell. Back to chapter one, uh, verse one. And so it really means that we strain forward with all our might to believe the best in all circumstances, in every situation. And then it goes to, it hopes all things. And again, another Greek word. Elpidsto, which depicts not only a hope, but the expectation of good things. It means that rather than assuming failure or bad things, many years ago I wrote a book, well, I guess it's only five years, but I wrote a book called Interrupted Process. And in that book, I wrote about this um, study that was done by the University of Colum uh, Columbus. And in that study, what it was found that 82% of the things we think are wrong or we think are gonna happen, never happen. And it goes all the way when you add the variances of what happens and how it happens, you end up with like less than five or 6% that actually ever happen the way you think it's going to happen. And so hopes all things. <clears throat> it always believes the best of someone. It is filled with an anticipation to see the manifestation of the thing hoped for. Do you and I pray for others? Do we pray for our children, our parents, our spouses, our friends? Do we believe what we're praying? And if we do, then hope should arise. Hope should be one of those big flowers in our garden and not one of those disappointments in a battlefield spelled legalism. Love always expects and anticipates the best in one another. It, it talks about, and it uses the word for endure, is the word hupomino, which um, it means under staying or under abiding. Hupo is the under, and uh, the other part of the word is abiding. And when it's brought together, it depicts the attitude of someone who is under a heavy load because they're undergirding someone. They're moving towards change in someone's life. And, and so that attitude is one of, I'm never gonna give up. I'm never gonna give up on that person because I know this is the place. This is the place that the Lord has me. This is the place that he wants me, serving, loving, undergirding, helping, doing all the things that we know to be truth. And so the Bible says, when it says to endure all things, what it's saying is it never quits and it never surrenders and it never gives up. And that was the title of this message, Love Never Fails. Love Never Fails. And so when we write it all out, just that small amount of verses, love protects, shields, guards, covers, conceals, and safeguards people from exposure. It strains forward with all its might to believe the be very best of others in every circumstance and love always expects and anticipates the best in others and the best for, for others. And it never quits and it never surrenders and it never gives up. Verse eight, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be restrained. Where there is knowledge, it will be dismissed. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial passes away. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I set aside childish ways. Now we see, but a dim reflection is in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, 
Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. That's the end of our scriptures. That's the end of the teaching plays. Love never fails. Love never fails when love is acted on. Love never fails when we activate it. Love never fails when we utilize it. Love never fails when we walk in it. Love never fails when we allow it to be the transforming force in our lives. And so whether it's protests in our community, COVID-19, masks, no mask, political candidates, unpolitical candidates, relationships, any of those things, love never fails. Lee, you can apply this to every area of your life. Yeah, you can. I do not believe that the Lord would say, I am love and I'm gonna live in you and I'm gonna give you grace the empowering face-to-face, -face, first and foremost, Jesus is, is, is grace. I'm going to give you that power to not be short-tempered, to not be intolerant, to not give up on people. I'm giving you grace, and all you need to do is allow the deadness. I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, the life I live is not my own, not my own. People talk to me often about rights and opinions. They pale in comparison to dead people. In our deadness, the resurrection power is alive to come forth. It doesn't cause us to look like what we used to, but to recognize who we are. And so I'm going to close on that. And we're going to take communion together. And communion is about love. Communion is about love. It's about recognizing that the person sitting next to you, who you may have had an argument with this morning, the person on the other side of this uh, screen who may have disappointed you, the person who called you a bunch of names, I, I, found, I found over the last few weeks that because I believe so strongly in the power of grace and, and, and the performance of love, meaning love performs, not I perform and not I perform love, but love, love does amazing things. That it makes me not belong to a lot of people's tribes. It removes the inclusivity in groups and places that I was before. And you know what? I, I could double down and I could become the grace police, but that's not the answer. The answer isn't a doubling down. The answer is love because love never fails. The answer is found even in the, 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 the simple act, which has miraculous working power of communion. That when Jesus took the cracker, the bread, and he, he divided it and he gave it, each one of his disciples, what he was saying, there's enough here for all of us. Well, Lee, that's only one cracker. Ah, but remember the little boy who brought his meal to a gathering of thousands of people? And when Jesus asked the disciples to go feed the people because they had been sitting too long, and they found this little boy and this little boy had a bag lunch with a little fish and a little bread. And it fed thousands, thousands. This miraculous wafer, this miraculous body of Christ has the potential to feed everyone. And if Jesus just wanted them to feed the people and leave the lesson behind, they probably wouldn't have gathered up all the food to find out that there were 12 baskets of food left. So when I say that grace doesn't understand math, 
How does a bag lunch, how does a happy meal on a Sunday translate to a banquet for thousands? Only grace can do that. So he took the bread and he said, this is my body. As often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat and let the miraculous working power of my body be here. And in like fashion, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood. Drink. And people would say, well, there's, that cup didn't, couldn't go around. Ah, we forget Jesus' first miracle at Cana, where he turned water into wine. And the firkin spilled out. And the wine was so good that they said to the host of the, of the, the wedding, you saved the best for last. Today, Jesus has saved the best for last. As I took that bread and I took that cup, I'm reminded of my love for my brother and sister, for the ones I know, for the ones I don't know, for the ones I've battled with, for the ones I've been in harmony with. Because I believe that the transformational power of love will change our nation. If it only could change Facebook. <laughs> Seriously, though, you and I have the opportunity to transform a world. I think most properly so, we would be the walking dead. And we would be able to walk in our deadness with the resurrection power, the dunamis power of Christ living through us. And so today, as we go about the rest of our day and the rest of our business, let us remember who Christ is, that he loved us first, that we might love him, that we would love him and we would love ourselves and we would love our neighbors regardless of a belief schedule, because the only thing that matters is the theology of Christ, and Christ is perfect theology. I love you guys. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll be back here next week, and uh, I really appreciate you. Thank you.